of democratic procedures in Australia. Regrettably, and, I don't like uh, interrupting you when you're saying nice things about me. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. But I it being 2 p.m., the debate is interrupted in accordance with Standing Order 101A. The debate may be resumed at a later hour. Before I move on to question time, there are a few uh, words that I might say to the House. The first is that, uh, as we all know, in this adversarial place, question time is probably the most significant of all the parliamentary occasions, is when not only the eyes of each of us as members are on the other, but when the eyes of the Australian public are on us. And uh, I draw members' attention for that reason, both to the nature of questions and the way in which they should be answered. All members should be aware of the contents of Standing Order 144. That lays down very tight conditions on the nature in which questions may be asked and the way in which they should be presented. And I urge all members to take note of those. Secondly, uh, I am aware that uh, there has been a procedure under Section 151 or Standing Order 151 whereby uh, supplementary questions have been accepted at the discretion of the Speaker. I do not propose to exercise that discretion. Secondly, um, I think it is important that we understand. I suggest that your, your, as a dispassionate observer of the place, and I assure those who are very vocal in their opposition to that change, to say that having sat there and observed the procedure, I haven't felt in any way they have enhanced the nature and character of question time. I would then say that with respect to, uh, to Standing Order 145 that I would ask all ministers to take note a bit of shush, thank you very much. I would ask all ministers to note the requirement that their answers be relevant. I would say to them that there is a procedure which is identified in Standing Order 101 which sets down a process for ministerial statements that if ministers seek to make a long, detailed uh, answer, particularly read from a brief provided by a departmental officer, it would be far better if they were given by way of ministerial statement. I would suggest also that long answers are inappropriate and do not enhance the procedures of this place. The other aspect of the standing orders to which I wish to draw attention was that under Standing Order 321 there is a procedure whereby a minister having quoted from a document he may be asked to table that particular paper or document and in uh, response the minister may claim confidentiality. I would say to ministers that uh, I believe in many instances that confidentiality has been abused, that if ministers wish to quote from papers or documents they are at liberty to take an extract from whatever that document might be so that it may be tabled. I would also say to you that in the normal course, unless that statement or letter or document is stamped confidential, that I believe it should be tabled and I will be requesting them so to do. On that basis, are there any questions? Just I think it might be appropriate if you allowed the honourable member Hotham is at the box, and I will not call until you've kept a little shush about the place. The honourable member Hotham. Mr. Speaker, I understand that uh, you said. You that seek indulgence. I do seek indulgence, Mr. Speaker. Indulgence is given. Thank you. I understand in your comments, and I'll need to go through them in more detail. But I understood you to say that in relation to supplementary questions, it was not your intention to uh, allow them. Can I draw your attention to the fact that? 151 understanding orders does provide for the ability of supplementary questions to be asked. Am I to take it that what you're ruling is that you are going to exercise the discretion sight unseen before the, before the supplementary question is made? I intend to follow the practice of speakers in this place in the 35 years of which I have been a member, other than in the last brief time. I call the Prime Minister to advise the ministerial arrangements. Mr. Uh, Speaker, Mr Speaker, I inform the House that the Minister for Defence, Industry, Science and Personnel uh, will be absent from question time today. She will be opening the Tent Force Support Unit in Townsville. The Minister for Defence will answer questions in her absence. Are there any questions? Prime Minister, is the Prime Minister aware of the fact that growth in the year to December 1997 was 3.6 per cent, 
which is both weaker than expected and significantly lower than growth, when Labor let off, left office, which was 4.7 per cent in the year to March 1996. Can the Prime Minister explain why Australians should not be concerned that the economy is this soft ahead of the anticipated downturn which will flow from the Asian economic crisis, which, according to today's trade and outcomes objective statement, will lead to slower growth and a reduction in employment in 1998-99? Prime Minister. Well, Mr uh, Speaker, um, the national account figures that were released today show that the Australian economy grew by 0.5 per cent in the December quarter to yield an annual growth rate of 3.6 per cent. For the, an annual growth rate of 3.6 per cent, and that annual growth rate compares very favourably with most other countries. And can I say that if we had not taken the corrective measures that we did when we inherited the $10.5 billion deficit that you left to us, then the Australian economy would not now be as strong as it is. And so far as the Asian troubles are concerned, it is, it is beyond argument that if we had not taken the measures we had taken, Australia would not have the lowest inflation rate in the Western world. We would not have such a high level of business investment. We would not have turned a deficit of $10.5 billion into a prospective surplus, and we would not have, importantly, delivered interest rate cuts to average Australians that are the equivalent of, of, a, of a wage rise of $90 to $100 a week. Now, Mr Speaker, the truth is that if our opponents had been in charge of the Treasury benches over the last two years, we would not have been able to have delivered those interest rate cuts. A little Wage quiet, and salary please. earners would be $90 to $100 a week worse off in equivalent terms, and the Australian economy would be infinitely more vulnerable to the turmoil now sweeping through the Asia-Pacific region. The Honourable Member for Keong. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and please accept my congratulations on your elevation. My question is addressed to the Treasurer. Can the Treasurer inform the House of the benefits to the Australian people flowing from the strong growth in the Australian economy as recorded in today's national accounts figures? I call on the uh, Honourable the Treasurer. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the, uh, the Honourable Member for Keyong for his question. <coughs> uh, Mr Speaker, uh, I'm sure members of the House will uh, welcome the fact that Today's national account shows Australia growing at one of the fastest rates in the developed world at 3.6 per cent. Mr Speaker, uh, good strong growth uh, up around three and three quarter, which uh, is the government's forecast for the 1997-98, uh, is consistent with good employment growth. And I'm sure all members of the House will also welcome the fact that uh, over the last five months, 140,000 new jobs have been created uh, in Australia. That is one of the benefits of the growth which we are now experiencing. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, the Small Business Survey uh, released today in conjunction with uh, uh, the Yellow Pages showed uh, increasing confidence amongst the small business sector. Uh, it was noted that, uh, uh, that uh, developments in Asia, of course, will have an effect holds. on confidence. But, um, uh, Dr Marsden of the Small Business Survey said these words, the impact of the Asian crisis is widely expected to take the gloss off what would otherwise have been near boom conditions, Mr Speaker. And I'm sure all people in small business will welcome that. Mr Speaker, uh, the positive news in relation to the small business sector also showed a remarkable step up in small businesses reporting uh, increases in uh, economic growth and economic outlook. Uh, Mr Speaker, but today's national accounts not only confirm strong growth in the Australian economy, consistent with good jobs growth, but Mr Speaker, it confirmed another record for Australia, an inflation rate down at 1.2 per cent in, uh, in uh, economy-wide terms, Mr Speaker, a, a position that the Australian economy has not been in for many an occasion. And it's because of that low inflation outcome that the Australian public will experience another benefit in relation to interest rates, with interest rates down around 6.5 per cent on the home standard variable mortgage, Mr Speaker, now the lowest home mortgage rate since the 1960s, which I'm sure members of the House will also welcome. That gives young people the opportunity to buy homes which they would never have had under the high interest rate policy of our predecessors. Young people who are getting the opportunity to get security and life 
to get into a home with a 6.5 per cent interest rate, which they have never been able to do in the last 30 years in Australia. This side of the House believes that strong economic growth and the employment growth that goes with it, low inflation and the low interest rates that go with it, can bring great benefits for Australians and their families. And as far as this side of the House is concerned, Mr. Speaker, these are good news results for the Australian public. The Honourable Member for Hotham. Speaker, thank you. My de question is directed to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, are you aware that today manufacturing production recorded a 0.6 per cent fall over the last quarter, dragging economic growth down as well? Given the obvious vulnerability of the manufacturing sector, why did the government today withdraw its legislation to implement your car plan of eight months ago? Will you instruct your industry minister to immediately bring the legislation on for debate so that Australian car workers, particularly those at Mitsubishi, can have some job security? The Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, Mr. Um, Speaker, my understanding in relation to the legislation is that the withdrawal has not been occasioned because of um, any change of heart in relation to the to the no to the no it's got nothing to do with that either I mean just just quietly just quietly listen and uh, I mean you had you had 13 years to get a decent industry policy and, uh, and, and uh, 13 years to get a decent industry policy I and you failed Mr. Australian Mr. Speaker Mr. Speaker the the reality is that the uh, the the change is to incorporate uh, another aspect of the, of the plan, and it's got absolutely nothing to do with any lack of resolve so far as the government is concerned. Mr Speaker, the, the other part of the Honourable General's question uh, goes very much to the heart of confidence in Australian manufacturing industry, and it gives me the opportunity to say a couple of things about that. I might remind uh, the House that the industry statement that I delivered on behalf of the government on the 8th of December last year was widely applauded and rightly so throughout Australian manufacturing industry. It was seen as striking the right balance between the government taking a limited but strategic role so far as industry is concerned, but avoiding the mistakes of a number of our Asian neighbours who have embraced industry policy that were please. far too interventionist. And, uh, and I mean, I mean it would be very interesting. It, it would be very interesting, be very interesting uh, Mr. Speaker, to comb through the statements made by the member for Hotham seven or eight months ago about the level of intervention that was needed in the economy and have a look at that in comparison with some of the levels of intervention in the economies of the Asian Pacific region, which are now seen, which are now seen as directly responsible for a lot of the economic troubles those countries are now experiencing. I mean, you were in the forefront. Uh, uh, many of Many of the statements you were making a few months ago were perilously close to the very models of intervention that are now roundly condemned by the International Monetary Fund and others. I mean, I mean you have been caught red-handed in, in cranking up the desirability of government intervention in the economy. Mr Speaker, what Australian manufacturers want is low inflation, they want <coughs> low interest rates, they want stability of economic policy. They want the predictability that, that a government surplus, as distinct from the instability of a government deficit, has delivered. And the message I get from the Australian manufacturing industry is that at long last we've got a government that attends to the economic fundamentals and the important foundation, and we have created a climate of growth, a climate of confidence, a little, shush, and a climate please. that has produced 140,000 new jobs over the last four or five months. And that is the greatest vote of confidence you can have in our economic management. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and may I also congratulate a you on your election. Quiet, please. Look, will you extend the same courtesy to others? That you would expect for yourselves, the Honourable Member Baker. That includes you too. Thank you, <laughs> Member Borhotham. My question is addressed to the Attorney General. I refer the Attorney General to a statement yesterday at question time that Senator Bolkus had released details of confidential federal court documents relating to Christopher Scase. What steps is the government taking to investigate this matter? I call on the Attorney General to provide an answer.
Mr. Speaker, I think Just before the... you start, can I say to members, if you persist in intervention, we'll stop the proceedings until you have. The Honourable Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for Macon for her question. As I said yesterday, Senator Bolkus has been captured red-handed on video, revealing to the media the contents of confidential federal court documents relating to Christopher Scase. Those documents, as I said, appear to have been given to Senator Bolkus unlawfully or improperly, or obtained by him unlawfully or improperly. The exposure of the information has the potential to frustrate completely the considerable efforts being made to recover Scase assets overseas. In view of the significance of the leak, the Minister for Justice has requested the Australian Federal Police to investigate it. When he was leaking the contents of the document to the media, Senator Bolkus is apparently recorded as saying, I can't give this document out, but maybe if I just read it off the record. <laughs> this this is the proceedings in court. A little quiet, please, on the government side. What's Beasley doing? Mr. Beasley doing about this? Mr. Can Speaker, we have a little more quiet, please? The attorney. Mr. Speaker, in the circumstances, there seems to be no doubt that Senator Bolkus would be able to assist the federal police with their inquiries. <laughs> The Australian public has a great interest in this case affair, and there are many creditors owed millions of dollars who have a great stake in the attempt to recover the overseas assets. Mr Speaker, what should happen is this. The Leader of the Opposition should instruct Senator Bolkus to stand down and to cooperate with the Federal Police. Mr Speaker, will the Leader of the Opposition do it? No, he won't. The Leader of the Opposition does not control people like Senator Bolkus. A little more quiet, please. The, lead, leader, the leader of the Opposition. the Opposition does not require his shadow ministers to adhere to any proper standards of conduct. Will, this, will the Leader of the Opposition stand Senator Bolkus down? No, he won't. The Opposition will continue to do whatever it takes to score a political point, no matter what the consequence no matter how reprehensible the conduct. The Honourable, uh, the Honourable Member for Batman. Mr Speaker, the first issue is the Minister was referring I'm to a document. I'm afraid you've got to ask your question. To whom is it addressed? Mr Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Does the Prime Minister recall his statement to the National Press Club two years ago that, quote, on that great issue of youth unemployment, we have committed ourselves above all other commitments to do something about reducing the tragically high levels of youth unemployment in our community. End of quote. Prime Minister, isn't it true that on the second anniversary of that statement, the youth unemployment rate stands at 28.7 per cent, 2.3 per cent higher than when you made your promise? Oh, yeah. I call yeah. on the Honourable the Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, by way of, by way of, uh, by way of pre oh, it's a cop-out. Well, uh, I, I, I can understand um, why the Leader of the Opposition I am reminded, reminded by my colleague, the Minister for Employment, that the level was 32 per cent when the Leader of the Opposition was Minister for Employment. And not only was the youth unemployment rate 32 per cent, 32 per cent, I mean, 32 per cent, I mean, I mean it was 32 per cent youth unemployment, the general rate was 11.2 per cent, he gave us over a million unemployed and he left us with a with a deficit of $10.5 billion. That is a trifecta of failure and deceit that hasn't been matched in the Australian Parliament ever. But Mr Speaker, I'm asked about the policies of the government in relation to youth unemployment, and I want to thank the, the member for Batman for uh, giving me the opportunity of saying a few things about them, because uh, it is, as I know the member will agree, an extremely important and, and indeed a critical issue. It enables me to remind the House that uh, my colleague announced last year a, a new approach to uh, apprenticeships and traineeships that will create 100,000, not, not 10,000, not 20,000, but 100,000 new apprenticeships. It gives me uh, the opportunity quiet, of, um, of reminding the House that um, 
the new industrial relations legislation that was introduced by my colleague, the Minister for Workplace Relations, has given far greater flexibility and therefore far more opportunities for the creation of traineeships which are suitable to the needs of individual employers and employees. And I might also remind the House that one of the changes that uh, was negotiated in relation to the passage of that legislation was the postponement of a very foolish proposal from the former government which would have phased out the uh, youth rates allowed under the then and now the continuing law. And if that had not been done, if we had not enlisted the aid of the minor parties in the Senate to do that, we may have put at risk the jobs of over 100 or 150,000, 200,000 young Australians. Now, you were held then on a course of action because you'd been told to take it by the ACTU, which would have abolished the youth award rate that would have pushed up the price of their labour and it would have thrown perhaps 200,000 young Australians out of a job. And you've got the nerve to get up here and pose as a friend of the young unemployed. And, but of course uh, the, the evidence, Mr Speaker, that the indifference of the chat, Labor please. Party doesn't stop there. One of the things that we have introduced uh, to help uh, instil a, the work ethic and a sense of um, a, a, a better sense amongst young people who are finding it hard to get work is the Work for the Dole scheme, a scheme that has widespread community support, a scheme that is acclaimed by young people as well as the community generally, and at every stage the Labor Party is opposed to, to Work for the Dole. Their instantaneous reaction, and, and you were a prime example of it, and you nod your head again, you hate the Work for the Dole scheme, don't you? And if you got back into government, one of the first things you'd do would be to abolish the Work for the Dole scheme. Well, I want to tell the member for Batman that not only has the Work for the Dole scheme been introduced, but in my Federation speech in January of this year, I announced a major expansion of the mutual obligation principle, a principle that says that if people cannot get work, then they are entitled to look to the government for support but the government is entitled on behalf of the community to ask them if they're able to do so to put something back. You don't believe in mutual obligation. You want to destroy the work for the Dole scheme and by your slavish adherence to the union line on award wages, if you'd have continued in office, you'd have threatened another 200,000 jobs for young Australians and you have no credibility at all asking me questions about youth unemployment. Before I call the honourable member for Patterson, there's no need to gauge in this crisp Criss-cross chat all the time. The honourable member for Patterson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as one of my neighbouring electorates, may I offer you my hearty congratulations on your elevation to the office of Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is addressed to the Minister for Workplace Relations and Small Business. Before question time today, we had the Shadow Minister for Small Business, the member for Cunningham, stating that small business in the Hunter told him that they did not consider unfair dismissal reforms as important. Minister, when will small businesses in my electorate receive the promised exemptions from unfair dismissal laws so they can get on with the job of employing the unemployed Australians in the Hunter? Minister, who or what is holding up this reform and how widespread is the community support for this move? Minister for Industrial Relations. The Honourable Member for Corwell on a point of order. Yes, Mr Speaker. What is your point of order? Uh, he is drawing reference uh, in, in his uh, Understanding order on questions, he is drawing conclusions in the introduction to the question. There's no point of order. Fact... The honourable member Patterson, have you finished your question? I call the honourable minister for industrial relations. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, um, I thank the member for his uh, question. It's the Labor Party that's holding up the passage of this legislation, Mr. Speaker. The, uh, the bill has now been represented again for a second time to the Senate. And we can only hope that uh, common sense will prevail and that these important uh, reforms for the benefit of small business can go through. Mr Speaker, this has been one of the greatest fiascos of industrial relations policy in the history of the Federation. And really no single measure could have done more damage to the small business community than that measure which has been introduced by the Labor Party introduced by the Leader of the Opposition and the member for Kingsford Smith, who still sit on the front bench of the Labor Party and whose, whose actions today are preventing 
the passage of legislation which would actually finally start to fix up the problem which they were responsible for. But it's worse than that, Mr Speaker. Not only is this a record on behalf of the Labor Party of failure, uh, massive failure in respect of uh, the small business community, it's also a record of deceit because if you go around the electorate, in the, in the member for Patterson's electorate, I can tell you what small business are saying. They are saying they want this exemption. And do you know why I know that they want what, what they are saying? It's because the, uh, the, the uh, candidate, Bob Horne, the former yeah. federal member and the shadow minister for unions over there, had a $100 a head so-called function for the small business community. They only got 30 to turn up. They only got 30 to turn up. But the next day, the next day, Bob Horn uh, on uh, ABC Newcastle uh, said that this issue of unfair dismissal was actually raised during the meeting. Actually raised during the meeting, and he said this. He said, "We've got to try and build up our permanent jobs. Employers are resisting pe putting people on the permanent staff simply because of things like unfair dismissal." So, so, so he. he he denies the problem. His candidate knows what the problem is because small business have said so. But I oh know the deceit. The deceit of these people is absolutely mind-boggling. He went on to say that the reporter asked him. He said, "So is there a chance then that changes to those particular areas would be in any ALP employment policy that might be put forward before the next election?" Well, he's just had a function with the shadow minister for employment. He's asked the question, "Might you fix up the problem?" And this is his answer. Well, I'm sure we'd be looking at streamlining those factors? Yes. So he's, saying, so he's out the electorate saying, yes, it's a problem. We hear small business. His, his mates are back here stopping the measure going through the Senate. And even worse, if these, the hypocrisy of these people knows no bounds. Their policy used to be, you know, the draft policy last year, the one that was going to have another review in it, their policy was Labor will seek means of giving small business greater incentive to provide jobs, particularly for the long-term unemployed, but they took that out because the unions wanted it out, and instead they put in uh, they will support small business, provided that firms meet their social and industrial relations obligations by implementing fair and cooperative relationships with workers and their representatives. And their representatives. This, this is unbelievable, Mr Speaker. The, the small business community, when Labor was in, had a, gov had a government that, that delivered one of the great fiascos of industrial relations, which damaged small business. In fact, right across the board, Mr. Speaker, their policies damaged small business. And when we move to fix up the problems, whether it's unfair dismissal or chasing SCASE, uh, we've got your little mate up there in the Senate supporting SCASE against the interest of small business. Who do you reckon is in the long list of people who are owed money by the fraudulent practices of Christopher SCASE? Well, none other than literally thousands of small business people in this country. Another example of the damage you did to small business. And what's your answer to your little mate in the Senate? Absolute, absolute sits there mute and embarrassed when he's got one of his own front benches admitting publicly that he should not be publicly releasing this information. He says, I can't give this document out, a public admission that he should not then do what he proceeded to do, but he says, but maybe if I just read it out off the record. This is a disgrace, Mr Speaker. When it comes to the small business community, not only are you preventing the remedies being put in place uh, to uh, uh, overcome the damage done by the Labor Party when they are in government. Here you are. You have front benches who are actually supporting somebody like Christopher Scase, and as the first law officer, as the alternate, as the shadow Attorney General, publicly admitting that he was wrong to release confidential material on a court file then proceeding to do so. We have it on tape. We've effectively got photos of the bloke, scripts of the bloke, video of the bloke, and this weak leader, this weak leader who so damaged the interests of the small business community, sits here unable to discipline one of his own front benches. I call on the honourable member for Trospect. A little bit of quiet on the government side, I, please. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to direct my question, Mr. Speaker, without notice, to the Minister of Employment, Education, Training and Youth Affairs. And I draw the Minister's attention to an article in today's Fairfield Liverpool Champion reporting that a firm, Employment Interactive, has won a tender 
for 12 employment service Look, sites around more quiet, Sydney. It's impossible to Isn't hear. it the case, Minister, that this is an unincorporated body? It has no infrastructure, no offices, and no employees. Can the minister inform the House what financial viability checks were made on the organisation's principal, Mr Kanda Rowood? Can the minister also inform the House what probity checks were made on Mr Rowood, who, as an employee of the Islamic Council of New South Wales, helped write the Council's unsuccessful tender while separately tendering? Is the minister concerned that even low employment this is going very, very has close hung to out being of shingle, order. Mr Rood has come to an arrangement for the work to be done by another group because he cannot I think you might write him a letter. I ask the honourable member to sit down to resume his seat, rewrite the question and put it in order. The next question, please. The honourable member for Aston. Honourable member for Hotham. Point of order, yes, honourable member for Hotham. Are you ruling that that question is out of order? That question is out of order. Then I dissent from your you ruling, may, Mr Speaker. But you've got to do it in writing and you've got to do it immediately. I Can you do it? I don't hear you until you've written it out and I've received it at the table. Right. Can I have a little bit of quiet, please? I'll call the Honourable Member Aston directly. Mr Speaker, this is a situation that you have brought upon yourself today because in circumstances in which the Minister has been running around the country touting the great success of his new employment initiatives, heralding the fact that what they've got is more entrance into the field, he's been ignoring the fact that the basis upon which the contracts were being let took no regard for the circumstances of previous operators, no regard to the bona fides of people that were bidding for these contracts, no check on them, and yet he's trying to argue the point argue the point that they've got a much more effective system in place. Mr Speaker, I would a ask you, quiet, I would I'd ask like to you wise, uh, to dissenting from my ruling apart from anybody else, the Honourable Member Hoffman. I would ask you to go back and look at this question, because what it does is it draws attention to an article today in the local newspaper of the member. You are one that has argued consistently that more opportunity should be given for backbenchers to raise issues in this House. And on the first occasion you've got a backbencher up from outside, you've knocked her off. What sort of fairness is that? Well, I think the Honourable Gentleman could use a more happy expression. Better though I might be, I suggest you might use a more appropriate form of word. A little bit of quiet, please. You. You. Right, a little bit of quiet, please. The Honourable Member for Hotham. The other point that was in this question, and these are important facts to establish, so that the Minister, who is well known, he's got the nickname Doctora, because every time there's a new statistic goes out, he comes round with his little whiteout. Quiet, please. Comes out with his whiteout, manipulates the figures, and ignores questions put to him on order. the detail. The honourable member Sturt. Point of order. Mr. Speaker, understanding order 100, a dissent in the speaker's ruling. Debate shall be proposed to the House, and debate thereon shall proceed forthwith. I would put it to you that the debate should therefore be about the dissent from your ruling, not about the substance of the question. I thank so you I'd for your speaker to order. I thank you for your assistance, but there's no point of order. The honourable member of Hotham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The second, the second point that was raised in her question was that this was an unincorporated body. It had no infrastructure, no officers, and no employees. Now, I would have thought that a minister claiming that they had a better system in place should actually be asked to explain how he can award a contract to someone who hasn't got an office, hasn't got infrastructure, hasn't got employees. What sort of service are these people going to be offering, Mr Speaker? The third part of the question is— A little more quiet, please. Can the minister inform the House what financial viability checks were made on the organisation's principal, no. um, Mr Carter Rudy? And the reason for that is that there were requirements under the past principles that we administered for such, for such financial viability checks to be made. 
Indeed, I think if you look at the proceedings of the Auditor General, he in fact requires it. And indeed, if you had have made the viability checks, one would have assumed that, don't you think, a little question mark would have raised itself? No office, no infrastructure, no employees. How viable is that, Mr Speaker? I remind you, I are dissenting from my ruling. Yeah, absolutely. Fact. And I'm telling you why. Because this question was completely in order. It was completely in order. And you have made the decision to rule it out of order to, well, maybe to protect the minister, not on the question of length. And the reason you didn't do it on length is because the member for Patterson, the question before, went on with just as equally a long a question. I might also point out. I might also point, point out. Point of order, the honourable member for Patterson. I ask him to withdraw that. I find that objectionable. I ask the honourable member for Hotham to withdraw that remark, which the gentleman. But the member for Patterson finds offensive. <laughs> and I would Do you withdraw that remark? With I ask you to withdraw that remark. What remark? The remark to which the Honourable Member for Patterson took oh, offence. A little more. What so remark? It's the normal practice. I'm afraid we're, there is no point of order being taken at this time no, other than okay. the one by the Honourable Member for Patterson. And I would ask the this Honourable Member Hotham to withdraw that remark. Well, I don't even know what remark it was. But so it you might now... well withdraw it. Well, then I do withdraw right, whatever thank you. You it was. You but let me just say, can I have a little now, bit of quiet on the government side as well as the Are you going to require the minister, the leader of government, business of the house, and the prime minister to withdraw their remarks when you ask it of them? Unlike being stared down by your predecessor. There is a, another requirement that, if you wish to make remarks of that sort, you make them by substantive motion. So I ask you to move on to your dissent from my rule. I, I, I continue, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. I was making reference to the question previously made by the member for Patterson and draw your attention to the fact that his question related to a matter that had already been determined by this House and understanding orders there should therefore have been no capacity for it to be asked, a ruling that has been made on previous occasions in this House. Now, If you want to get technical with the standing orders and reckon you know them, you should have ruled him out. But what we've got is a circumstance in which he has breached the standing orders with the question that he's asked. He's been allowed to ask it, but as soon as one of our backbenchers gets up, you do not allow it. Is that even-handed, Mr Speaker? That's why I'm moving dissent from your ruling. And I continue on in terms of the detail of this question, because it's very important to get this on this record. And you have made a bad ruling today, and you've got to understand why you've made it. It's inconsistent on the one hand, and her question was not out of order. It was Hello, not out of order. Quiet, please. I'm still interested in what the honourable gentleman is saying. I think the everyone would like to hear it. The next part of the question is, can the minister also inform the House what probity checks were made on Mr Ruday, who was an employee of a council? Now, understand this, Mr Speaker. He was an employee of a council that made a bid for an employment contract. The council got knocked off. I'm sorry if that term offends in that circumstance too. The council did not succeed, but Mr Ruday succeeded by putting in a, a submission at the same time, a different submission. Now, again, can I just ask you to understand what we're dealing with here in terms of this man this man who argues as minister that he's put in place this great new system, he allows, an offer, he allows a contract to go to someone without an office, without employees, without infrastructure, but worse, this person is an employee of a body working to get that body up and at the same time writing his own the submission. For customs excise. The Honourable Member for Hotham is proposing dissent from your ruling. He must therefore confine his remarks to the appropriateness of your ruling and not canvass the issues of the question. Thank you very much. I call the Honourable Member Hotham. I think that uh, there's some truth in what he says. At the same time, I think it's also quite valid for the Honourable Member Hotham to argue the reason that he dissents. And I believe he's endeavouring to do so. Yeah, thank you, Mr Speaker. I mean, what we've got here is dissent from the Speaker's ruling. I'm entitled to say why we're dissenting because his ruling that the question was out of order. 
I'm saying the question was not out of order. And if you don't understand that as his henchman, if you don't understand that as his henchman, he's even he wasn't silly enough to get up and take that point of order. He cheated you up. I Come in, spinner. To the floor. Thank you very much. And then the final part the of the Member question. Honourable Member O'Connor, on a point of order. Clear reflection on the chair to suggest that anybody is the chair's henchman, and I would ask that that matter be withdrawn and an apology issued to yourself. Thank you very much, Honourable Member O'Connor. I call the Honourable Member Hotham. I didn't regard it as a friction on me. Just remind him you don't need his help too often. Never scored I've always his life. appreciative of him, particularly on his wedding anniversary. Oh, yeah. Oh, we all know that. Prime Minister wouldn't reassert his commitment to independence in the House, but he did get up and announce the 40th anniversary of Wilson Tucky. What a sham you are. Oh, there we are. We say, will you reassert your, Can your I commitment to an independence speech? And you say, happy hand. anniversary. Happy anniversary. Right, a little bit of quiet, please. Let's get back to uh, the matter in hand. The Honourable Member Hotham. <laughs> and then the, que then the last part of the question, and bear in mind, Mr Speaker, that you had heard all of those points until the last paragraph that uh, was got to when you, drew her, when you asked her to— uh, I think you made some uh, comment that the question might have been going a bit too long. But, you said, but it then goes on to say, is the minister concerned that even though Employment Interactive has hung out its shingle, Mr Rudy has come to an arrangement for the work to be done by another group? Oh. Oh. Mr Speaker, this is the point of the question, and I would have thought entirely relevant to a parliament that's supposed to hold this mob accountable for the way in which they spend public money, to be able to ask a question in this form. One, one the body got a contract. The, the person got a contract. Secondly, the person who got the contract didn't have any visible means of support. Third, that person was bidding for an organisation at the same time as he was bidding for himself. Fourth, were there probity checks to establish whether this, this, quest, this um, contract should have been written? And then the fifth, and I would have thought the most telling point, the point at which you interrupted, which again went to show that this great contract that was being left, it was incapable of being delivered by the person who received it, because the person then contracted it out to someone else. Now, Mr Speaker, I must say, if you don't think that that is a relevant question, then I'm at a loss to know what you think is. Now, well, it is what he said. The ruling was, the ruling, the ruling was, go and get it in some sort of an order. Well, what's wrong with the order in which it came? I mean, what would you do? What would you do? Do you want to understand the order again, Mr. Speaker? Because clearly that leader of government business over there doesn't know any better. But the sequence of events is this. This is the order of the question. And tell me for the life of me how you would reorder it. The sequence of events is that the thing was reported in the newspaper. Fact one. The second, the and today. The second is that the body that received the contract was an unincorporated body without means. Without infrastructure, without an office, without any employees. The third was, did the minister seek to ascertain that fact? Did he carry out the probity checks? The fourth was, what probity checks were made of the individual, given that he was not only bidding in his own right, but he was bidding in be on behalf of an organisation, an organisation that lost the contract to him? And the fifth point, entirely appropriate, having got the contract, he then can't fulfil it. Now, Mr Speaker, I am at a loss to understand why that is not in the relevant order. And that's the ruling that you've made. You've said, I'm taking the question out, I'm not allowing the question because it's not constructed in the right order. And that's why I'm dissenting from the ruling. Now, Mr Speaker, we have made a commitment in this place with your predecessor and indeed with you today. A little more quiet, please, in the body of the, the By a apartment. speech, I might say, by a speech, I might say, that was measured by the Leader of the Opposition in contrast to those on the other side who 
sought to welcome you but forgot to do it. I mean, we had the Prime Minister today reminding you of Jim Cope's dismissal and your court case. I'm sure you were very appreciative of the fact that your pri the Prime Minister drew your attention to that when he thought he was welcoming you to the chair. You had the Leader of Government Business in the House also, also seeking to go on to the uh, Jim Cope there. I think he even forgot to thank you, uh, congratulate you, but don't worry. He's even handed this guy. He didn't even thank Bob Elverson properly yesterday when he fell from the chair. Now, the point we're making is this, Mr. Speaker. We are prepared. We are prepared to cooperate with the chair and try and ensure the orderly running of this house. But we are not going to be mugged. We are not going to allow ourselves. We are not going to allow ourselves to be mugged in terms of putting questions of legitimate importance, particularly backbench questions, particularly questions that relate to the member's electorate, the member for Prospect, particularly questions that relate to billions of dollars of taxpayers' money, and particularly the questions that are so important in the context of the economic debate at the moment because we believe that the government's employment, program, uh, um, employment policies have failed and we believe the structures they've put in place to try and get people into work have also failed. There's no point then trying to run around the country and say they've created 300 new outlets when they've gutted 1,300 of them. And if in fact this is an example of one of the replacement outlets, God help us. I mean, what hope is there going to be for the unemployed in this country? If they're told, oh yes, we've got this great employment agency out in Fairfield, trouble is we can't give you an office address, can't give you a telephone number, can't give you a fax. They haven't even got any employees, by the way, but they're there to help. This is a government initiative. We are there to help. This is the David Kemp solution to problems. We're there to help. Help with no people. Help the unemployed by giving a contract to a body that's got no people to help them get employed. And then there's Mr Ruday. Mr Ruday, he wins the contract. No doubt he sees some advantage to him in the way in which the contract's led and his ability to uh, get something for it. What does he do? He goes and hangs his shingle out and, and, and subcontracts his business to someone else. Now, I would have thought, Mr uh, Speaker, that that is a legitimate cause for question in this parliament. It's current to the issue of the day. It's the most vital policy issue facing this country, how we deal with the unemployed, how we ensure that assistance is delivered effectively, how we ensure that in terms of taxpayer assistance they get value for their money, not some shonky arrangement, not some shonky arrangements where the contract is let to someone who doesn't even have an office, a fax, an infrastructure, employees? I mean, this is the question that we wanted answered. And I must say, Mr Speaker, what you've done, what you've done is certainly have given us time to reorganise the question. We've had 20 minutes to reorganise the question. Trouble is, we would like an answer. But I must say, having argued this point, I find no difficulty with the way the member for Con uh, Prospect have constructed the question in the first place. And I don't think anyone on our side finds difficulty with it. And I would urge you to reconsider your ruling, urge you to reconsider the ruling and allow this question to be answered. The truth of the matter, Mr Speaker, is this. We are prepared to cooperate so long as we are being afforded the opportunity that we're entitled to in this House. That's the opportunity of making the government accountable, making a government that proclaimed in its policy that it wanted to be more accountable. Remember the time it used to float through and say, we're going to be available here uh, more often than the previous government. We're going to make sure that our ministers answer the questions. I was interested in your comments earlier when you came into the chair about the relevance of questions. We will be interested to see how that ruling is enforced, Mr Speaker, because yesterday we had the Prime Minister ask twice as to whether he was going to stick to his 40 per cent target on private health insurance. Today, he I ignored, the both times. ignored the question both times. Ignored the question both times. Mr Speaker, the reason this dissent has been moved 
and of course we're reluctant to do it on your first day. But I believe that the ruling that you have made is incorrect. I believe the ruling, if it's to be an indication of what you're up to in the future, will cause a shambles in this House. If you're not going to allow members on our side of the parliament to legitimately ask questions about their constituencies in the context of policy frameworks that we are arguing against, that we have a legitimate difference of opinion about. If we're not being allowed to ask the questions on the detail, the specificity related to the electorate, then there is no point in you. You may as well shut question time down. You may as well, Mr Speaker, because if that's not accountability in its truest form, what is? This is a question asked of a minister about an area that he's been um, proclaiming policy changes to the benefit of the nation in. This is all his own work. But what we seem to have here is a shonky arrangement. Now, he might be able to explain it, only you've stopped him giving the explanation. And you've stopped it because you think the question was out of order. Now, in the, in the time that I've had available, I've gone through point by point indicating why it was entirely in order. Mr Speaker, I would ask you to reconsider your ruling, allow the member for Prospect's question to be answered, because, uh, uh, asked, and most of all, we'd like to hear what the doctor is up to in terms of his defence. Because if this is the first one that we've found, if this is the first one that we've found, how many others of the 300 are in this category? The public deserves to know. The parliament certainly should. Your ruling is preventing that happening. Yeah. Is the I second the dissent seconded? The yes, I, the I second the, the motion. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I am uh, the first to concede that from time to time the opposition asks questions which test the standing orders to the limit. I'm the first to concede that. And uh, I'm the first to concede that from time to time we get our readings of standing orders wrong. And I'm the first to concede that from time to time we and government members will get up and ask questions in this place, the purpose of those questions of which is to make a point and the answer to them is largely irrelevant. These things happen in question time and uh, it is uh, part of the robust exchange and speakers enforcing the rules who might from, might from time to time interrupt that process. But there are occasions in the House when questions are actually asked that refer to the classic purposes of question time. And that is the purpose to hold a government accountable. That is why question time exists. It doesn't actually exist for other purposes. The other purposes have been grafted onto it. And holding governments accountable go to, uh, goes, of course, to the impact of their administration, the consequences of effects of their administration, and, uh, and, of and may from time to time, provided to win the other framework of the standing orders, go to their legislation. It does seem to me that you had an opportunity to rule out of order one question so far asked during the course of question time, and that was the one prior to that asked by uh, the, uh, the honourable member for Prospect. That was the one asked by the honourable member for Patterson. Because if you go to what standing orders say a question must contain, it says this: a question should not contain statements of facts or names of persons unless they are strictly necessary to render the question intelligible and can be authenticated. B. Arguments. C. Inferences. D. Imputations. E. Epithets. F. Ironical expressions. Or G. Hypothetical matter. And there are other elements of it that ask you, you can't ask for expressions of opinion and uh, you can't ask for announcements of government policy and the rest, uh, and the, and the rest of it. And nor can a question, a question cannot be debated. So if you go through all those particular elements and then go to the honourable member for, for Patterson's question, what you will find throughout it is argument, you will find inference, you will find epithet, ironical expression. You will find all of those throughout the, that member's questions, and that member's question was challenged in this place, and a ruling sought from you, and your ruling was to uphold it. That was your ruling. And, uh, that, so, as the media and others pass judgment on this debate today, a debate which we will lose because of the numbers in this place, I would urge them to look at the question asked by the honourable member for uh, uh, honourable member for Patterson, and then look at the question asked by, by the honourable member for Prospect, and ask whether, on this first day of a new speakership, 
the opposition has been dealt with, by, with consistently and with comparative fairness. Now I go to the question that was asked, and the first phrase in that is this. I draw the minister's attention to an article in today's Fairfield Liverpool Champion reporting that a firm employment interactive has won a tender for 12 employment service sites around Sydney. Now, is that a statement of fact or names of persons unless they are strictly necessary to render the question intelligible and can be authenticated? Well, they can be authenticated. We can produce the article that appears. And uh, I wouldn't have thought that there was an item in that which was in any way unnecessary. Is there an argument in that sense? No fair person would say there was. Is there an inference? Is there an imputation? Is there an epithet? Is there an ironical expression? Or is there hypothetical matter? And the answer is no. There is nothing of that in any of those parts. So I go to the second phrase. Isn't it the case that this unincorporated body has no infrastructure, no officers and no employees? Statements of facts? No. Uh, unnecessary? No. Arguments in that? No. Inferences? No. Imputations? No. Epithets? No. Ironical expressions? Or hypothetical matter? Now, of course there is none there. Of course there is absolutely nothing of that in that, uh, in that particular point, because the, because the simple fact of the matter is that uh, if you are if you're going to establish a case that there has been in some way or another an inappropriate activity, an abuse of process, uh, asking a question about whether or not there is an unincorporated body that has no infrastructure officers or employees, as the article indicates, that is an important thing to consider. And then the next point is, can the minister inform the House what financial viability checks were made on the organisation's principal, Mr Carter Rude? Is a name mentioned here unnecessary to the context of the question? No. Is there argument there? Could I ask the members of my left to be a little quiet is so we can all hear the Leader of the Opposition? Is there an imputation? Is there an epithet? Because they're not talking is there an ironical lot expression? Or is there hypothetical matter? And the answer is no. There is none of that in any of those cases. A, that's, and that is the third point of asking, as far as that question is concerned. And then there goes, can the minister also inform oh, the House them, what probity checks were made on Mr Rude, who is an employee of the Islamic yeah, Council of New South Wales, helped write the Council's unsuccessful tender while separately tending? Is there in there an unnecessary statement of fact, an argument? an inference, yeah, an yeah. imputation, an epithet, yeah, an yeah, ironical yeah. expression or hypothetical yeah, matter yeah. in any of those items in that particular question. Yeah. How else can you ask them? Yeah. If, you believe, yeah. if you believe on the basis of information that is presented to you that are actions have taken which may potentially or may be improper in relation to the administration of a person's portfolio, I ask you in all fairness, how could you ask the question in any other way? And then it goes on. Is the minister concerned that even though Employment Interactive has hung out its shingle, Mr Rude has come to an arrangement for the work to be done by another group because he cannot deliver on the tender? So I ask you again, is there any statement of fact in that which is, uh, renders the, the question in some way unintelligible? Is there argument? Is there inference? Is there imputation? Is there epithet? Is there ironical expression or is there hypothetical matter in that that uh, is uh, in some way or another rendering that phrase, the final phrase of the question, the final phrase of the question, an inappropriate question? I think in all honesty, Mr Speaker, you have probably picked on the one question we have taken so far that even the most stringent Scrooge-like interpretation of the standing orders could not have permitted you to rule it out of order. The one question thus far asked, probably in fact in debate today, the one question asked on either side of the House, the one question asked on either side of the House that probably actually conforms to the most Scrooge-like interpretation of straining orders. It didn't require a smidgen of generosity on your part, not a smidgen of generosity. The question asked by the member for Patterson, which will be inspected, I am sure now, by the media and others who are interested in this judgment on your first ruling and your first dissent motion on your first day, they will make a compare and contrast exercise on that question which you ruled in order. 
and uh, when they do that compare and contrast exercise, they will find a very large element of inadequacy lying at the very heart of it. At the very heart of it. And, uh, and when they do that, when they do that, of course, you will find uh, your, yourself in a situation, unfortunately, of some degree of embarrassment. This is an absolutely essential role for an opposition and for private members the ability to ask questions on matters like this. It is even more the case because the particular minister to whom it was directed has made an art form of abusing those other elements of the standing orders that you have drawn attention to from time to time and in your opening remarks, and that is the, uh, a, a wide irrelevant canvassing of his portfolio and a blow hardery of unsurpassed dimensions. And yesterday, indeed, and yesterday, indeed, this minister was up with these tenders that we are referring to. Well, this is a selection of tenders from those tenders that he is referring to, beating his chest and telling people what marvellous opportunity has been presented to them. So that other element of question time, that accountability, this is not something invented out of the air by the opposition, plucked out of the air by the opposition. Uh, it is a matter that goes heart and centre into a matter of public importance now before this nation, which this minister has been openly canvassing questions for himself on, these, on this matter and has been let off it now. Now, it's also a fact that the organisation, the, the Islamic Council, has had cause to complain about the affairs of Mr Rude. He's had this to say. They have indeed written to Deitcher and said this about it. Actions by one of our employees during the recent Deitcher tendering process may have breached the guidelines. It may also have compromised our tender for provision of employment Good services. Start, Mr Carter Rude has uh, said he'd submitted an independent tender while helping to prepare our own tender. Mr Rude had worked intimately with our own submissions for Flexi 1, Flexi 2 and Flexi 3. This matter has been raised at our last management committee meeting and Mr Rude was asked to resign. He has since done so and a copy of his resignation is attached. What we have here is a classic case of accountability, Mr Speaker, an absolutely classic case of accountability. This is an organisation in the community with a, a legitimate concern. Quiet, this is an organisation with a sides. legitimate concern. This is an organisation which has made its concern public. This is an organisation dealing with the government at a, at a crucial point, a critical point, of the delivery of an important part of government services. This is an organisation which has been gazumped by one of its employees who does not have an operation but has been successful with 12 tenders. This is, if, if question time means anything at all, if question time means anything at all, then these matters ought to be capable of being subject to question in the way in which they have been subject to question by the member for Prospect in this case. If that is a question that is out of order, then there is no, then there is no capacity for question time to function effectively. You may have been somewhat worried by the length of the question. I suspect in the error that you have made that perhaps you had that in mind. And therefore, I would ask you then to have reference to the question asked by the member for Patterson and this particular question. I am sure that you will find in length that there is no difference between the two as far as length of question is concerned. And it just may have occurred to you and caused you to make this ruling in the way in which you did the fact that you were slightly embarrassed about the ruling you made on the member for Patterson for a question that was clearly out of order and, uh, and, uh, and therefore determined that the next time you got hit, the next time you got hit, you would actually do something about it. Unfortunately, Mr Speaker, you have manifestly come across the wrong target, the worst conceivable target that you could have picked up. We have here an absolutely clear-cut case of accountability. I have been through all those points, and not a, a reasonable person could not have made a judgment that there are unnecessary statement of facts or reference to persons in it. There was not argument, inference, imputation, epithet, ironical expression or hypothetical matter in any part of that question at all. Not one word. Not one word. Now, I think the Leader of the House is about to get up and, uh, and defend you, as is his melancholy duty. And uh, he will no doubt say he will no doubt say during the course of it that somehow or other this whole question amounts to an argument. Well, I am afraid not. 
Argument is canvassing the issue. There was no argument in any single one of these sentences. In every single one of these sentences, it was the eliciting of information and to the point. And to the point. And only the most appallingly tendentious interpretation could be placed upon any element of it uh, to discount that. Now, Mr Speaker, I do understand that you wanted to come into this place and assert your authority on this, uh, is this your first day in office. It is an understandable thing for you to want to do. And uh, I do note that you did say, apart from asking us to stick to the standing orders as far as questions are concerned, you asked the other side to, uh, to uh, stop their enormous digressions, irrelevant abuse and all the rest of it. You didn't put it that way, but that was the implications of what you said. I am afraid to say that we would have to suspend judgment on the extent to which that part of question time has been enforced, because as far as I can see, although, though they were delivered at a lower level of decibel, the length of the answers that we have had so far, their argumentative nature, quiet, their levels of irrelevancy and all the rest of it have been pretty much up to standard practice. Pretty much up to standard practice. What has not been up to standard practice, however, has been our questions because we have sought at this Little question quiet, time please. to on phrase our side, questions yes. in such a way and on your that side they come too. within what we anticipated your sorts of rulings would be. And of all the questions we've been asked, this of all the questions has not one single jot or tittle of any offensive part, any offensive element to standing orders in it whatsoever. I am afraid to say, Mr Speaker, though you will win this particular vote as you must, because it will be a vote along party lines, it's a very, very bad start indeed. Yeah. The question is that my ruling be dissented from. I call the Honourable Minister for Workplace Relations and Sport Business. Uh, thank you, uh, House. Mr Speaker. The government will, of course, uh, uh, oppose the dissent from your ruling uh, on the grounds that a case has not been made out. Uh, Mr. Mr Speaker, I was not surprised after hearing the manager of opposition business, I was not surprised that the leader of the opposition felt it necessary to himself uh, speak in this debate to try and salvage uh, the claims being made by the manager of opposition business. Mr Speaker, can I start by saying that the uh, this uh, motion uh, graphically demonstrates to the House the wisdom of its choice earlier today, and uh, in particular the two characteristics you bring to the House, Mr. Speaker. Firstly, uh, patience and tolerance, which is uh, uh, an essential ingredient in dealing with uh, those opposite, and a touch of humour thrown in for good measure. And secondly, Mr. Speaker, an extensive knowledge of the standing orders which I want to demonstrate, uh, Mr Speaker, is certainly the case uh, on this uh, occasion. I was interested in the remarks of the uh, uh, Leader of the Opposition who, who said that this uh, question did not contain any uh, argument. But I, I distinctly heard him say, and I wrote it down at the time, he said words to the effect—we can check the hands hard later—but he said that the words in the question were necessary to establish a case. Those are your own words. I mean, during, during your own presentation, you actually substantiated the argument against your own motion of dissent. It was one of the most pathetic presentations I've seen. And to have, to have the manager of opposition business you know, stand and move a dissent ruling uh, against the first ruling from the new speaker is like the novice standing and telling the expert that the expert doesn't know what they're talking about. It's like the Minister for Finance with a $23 billion deficit in his last two years telling the Treasurer how to balance the books. <laughs> I mean, it's like a, you know, it's like a— I remember a on a point of order. I saw you musing and I thought I'd just prompt you, but you did draw my attention on a number of occasions— After you'd repeatedly when... extended beyond the norm. So you're going to allow it There's now? No Is that a new precedent, no Mr Speaker? The Honourable Minister. Oh. Oh. Uh, well, sadly, Mr. Speaker, those sort of uh, uh, smart remarks from the manager of opposition business only betray his real attitude. Mr. Speaker, in support of the uh, A ruling, bit quiet, please. Uh, in support of your uh, uh, ruling, uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to refer to the standing orders, which we didn't hear much of when the uh, leader of the opposition spoke, uh, but. Uh, 
and I don't do so for your benefit, Mr. Speaker, because you clearly uh, appreciate the uh, import of them. But for instruction of uh, members of the opposition, a little bit of uh, it's uh, appropriate to refer to them. Um, the first one I want to refer to, uh, Mr. Speaker, is uh, Standing Order 147, which is alteration of question. And uh, I presume, Mr. Speaker, you had this in mind. You certainly. Uh, reflected 147 in your first remarks to the member for Prospect. Uh, 147 says, the Speaker may direct that the language of a question be changed if it seems to the Speaker unbecoming or not in conformity with the standing orders of the House. My, my memory of it is, Mr quiet, uh, Speaker, please. that in a fairly generous spirit, after your patience had been tested by the member for Prospect, reading out a question which had been drafted for her by the Hopeless Tactics Committee in the Opposition. You did then invite her to uh, come back later after she'd had a chance to redraft her question. I must say, Mr Speaker, I thought that was a very generous uh, gesture on your part, and uh, that was the first thing that you did. Mr Speaker, under uh, uh, Standing Order 147, the, word, the relevant words I want to point out are uh, that you can require the, the uh, language to be changed if the words of the person asking the question are not in conformity with the standing orders. So the question, the question then is, well, in what respect was that question uh, in breach of standing orders, and uh, which standing orders therefore should we turn to? Well, Mr. Speaker, there are actually a number of standing orders which support the decision that you've made. Um, 144 is the obvious one, but it's necessary also to refer to Standing Order 153. Questions shall not be asked which reflect on or are critical of the character or conduct of those persons whose conduct may only be challenged on a substantive motion, and notice must be given of questions critical of the character or conduct of other persons. Uh, well, uh, I have the interjection. <laughs> I don't know anything he said. I mean, really, this, this is. Uh, well, I mean, the words speak for themselves. I will now read from House of Representatives practice uh, something which I direct the Leader of the Opposition to read for a first time. On page 515, it says, Questions critical of the character or conduct of other persons cannot be asked without notice. And then it goes on to say, The purpose of the rule is to protect a person against criticism which could be unwarranted. A question on notice does not receive quiet, the please. same publicity and prominence Could as I a, a little question little without. Quiet, please. I call the honourable minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the uh, the words of House of Representatives practice could not be more crystal clear. They say a question on notice does not receive the same publicity and prominence as a question without notice, and the reply can be more considered. So, so. Uh, the first thing you would say about this uh, question or series of questions is that they, they couldn't have been more clearly in breach of Standing Order 153. And in fact, the Leader of the Opposition uh, went through the various parts of the question uh, which he claimed, uh, which he claimed uh, were uh, you know, free of uh, or in conformity with the Standing Orders. Well, I'm, I'm gratefully read them out because. Uh, these are the things that this part of the question that he read out. Um, he says uh, part of the question was what financial checks were made, and he says, "Oh, that's a totally neutral question. Totally neutral question." Well, I put it to you. I put it to you that that was a that the whole purpose of this question was to raise a prospect. The whole purpose of the question was to raise a question mark to make a criticism of a tender and the tenderer, which has been the responsibility of the minister. A, a, further, quiet, a further question which supports this uh, was that part of the, the question which, prospect. which said uh, what probity checks were made on a named individual. Now, what is that? What, is, what was the whole purpose of the question put to the Minister for Employment? The whole purpose of the question was the to make some allegations about the propriety and the uh, uh, financial sense of offering or providing uh, a contract to a named individual. The whole purpose of the question Donald was a character assassination on a, on a named individual as you wanted to secure what you believe is a few cheap political points for the Labor Party. And uh, one of the questions uh, which was read out 
in part by the Leader of the Opposition, contained the words as I wrote them down that uh, Mr R cannot deliver on the tender. Now, what is that if it is not a claim that a named person is unable to fulfil their obligations under a contract uh, presumably to be let to the Commonwealth? Uh, that, was, that was in the question. It is in breach of standing order 153. That is what he said. And Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, the, the, whole, the whole purpose of the question, as he the went on to expound in his defence uh, of uh, this dissent ruling, the whole, the whole basis of the question was in fact an attack on the financial probity and the character of this particular named individual. So, Mr. Speaker, on, uh, on the question of a being in breach of uh, the standing orders on 153, uh, it's, it's, it's an absolutely open and shut case. But I mean, it's even more, it's even more definitive than that. The, uh, from the Could psycho, I a little more quiet, the please, cycle, the front bench? Well, I mean, there's a lot of psycho babble coming from the other side, but this is the, Mr. Speaker, this would be the clearest case of a ruling being uh, in conformity with the standing orders that I have seen for a very long time. And in respect of uh, the, the balance of the standing orders, the opposition. I'm going to get him to keep quiet. In, in respect of standing order 144, uh, questions cannot be debated. Now, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition Honourable made it the quite clear that the Canberra. purpose of the question being put uh, was, in fact, to, uh, in the form of a question, uh, make an argument against the conduct of the Minister for, for Employment. Now, Mr. Uh, Speaker, on those grounds alone, uh, there is absolutely no doubt, under uh, Standing Order 153, you were entitled to. Uh, uh, in a generous spirit, suggest to the member that she go away and redraft a question. Uh, that needed to be founded on some aspects of the standing orders and based uh, on uh, the uh, question and the import and intent of the question, it was clearly in breach uh, of those uh, parts of the standing order which prevent character assassination during question time, questions without notice. They prevent, they prevent a a question which is, uh, uh, which is uh, to be debated, because standing order says questions cannot be debated. Uh, questions should not contain arguments, inferences or imputations, and it's quite clear from the statement made by the Leader of the Opposition that that was the whole purpose uh, of the question in the first place. So, Mr Speaker, uh, on any fair, reasonable analysis uh, of that question, uh, your ruling was entirely in conformity with the standing orders, entirely in conformity with the House of Reps practice. It couldn't be clearer. And you can only conclude, therefore, that the tactics committee, someone, the leader probably said to Simon Crean, oh well we got a got a new speaker, so Simon, you know, as soon as you get a chance, whip in a uh, a motion of dissent. And the only thing you didn't tell Simon is make sure if you've got a motion of dissent, you've actually got some basis. Make sure, make sure, Simon, that you actually have a case that you can mount. And uh, uh, the, the fact that the Leader of the Opposition, after hearing the most pathetic performance—in fact, I would say a juvenile performance by the Manager of Opposition Business—after hearing that, he clearly felt sufficiently embarrassed that he himself had to, to uh, rise and to try and defend and salvage uh, the uh, dissent ruling that they put. Mr. Uh, Speaker, I don't think we should waste the, house, uh, the, the, yeah, the, yeah. the time of the House anymore. Uh, this is an absolutely open and shut case, and I move that the question be put. The question is that the question be now put. Those in favour, please say aye. Those against, no. Is the division required? Division required. I call the, the clerks to ring the bells.
I'd feel a lot happier if I were able to defend myself, but I can't in these circumstances. The eyes will move to the right of the chair. Uh, lock the doors. I bet that'd be a good idea. <laughs> lock the doors. The eyes will move to the right of the chair. The nose to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Karangamite, Fish and Riverina. Tell us for the eyes. The honourable members for Bruce Fowler and Maribyrnong. Tell us for the nose. Oh, you did, right. <laughs> I keep about forgetting about locking the doors and things like that.
not have taken it. The result of the division is ayes 87, noes 46. I declare the motion carried. I therefore put the question that the ruling I gave, that the question by the Honourable Member for Prospect was out of order, be agreed to. Be agreed to. Those in favour of the question, please say aye. aye. Those against, no. Aye. Is the division acquired? Division being acquired, ring the bells for one minute, it being a successive division. I ask members to take note of those provisions. I ask uh, all members, please, to take their places as quickly as possible. Eyes will move to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I point the honourable members for Angamite, Fish and Riverina. Tell us for the eyes. The honourable members for Bruce, Fowler and Maribyrnong. Tell us for the nose.
The result of the division is noes 87, ayes 46. I'm pleased to be able to tell you that the motion of dissent is lost. I ask members to return to their place as uh, quickly and as soon as possible. I'll give you that. I ask members to return to their places as quickly as possible, please. I call the honourable member for Aston. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is addressed to the Minister for Trade. Can the Minister outline the Government's trade success, successes and wins last year, and can the Minister also detail the significance of the recently released Trade Outcomes and Objective Statement? The Honourable the Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Member for Aston for his question and recognise his role in the, the committee system. I want to make the point that overarching all in respect of trade last year was an all-time record $104 billion of exports in both goods and services to the world and beyond Asia as we sought to diversify beyond Asia. So some of the countries increasing in exports, Iran up 71 per cent, Egypt up 51 per cent in the Middle East, South Africa up 31 per cent, and the Minister Moore and myself conducted the first joint ministerial in South Africa mid-year last year, and Mexico up 24 per cent. And turning to the trade outcomes and objective statement in absolute terms, detailed in here is some of those breakthroughs. And with Mexico, uh, with negotiations as we injected real energy into the Point bilaterals. Of order, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. You, uh, in your opening remarks, you referred to the point that uh, ministers ought not to be making, answering questions in the way of the nature of statements. The Honourable Minister has made a statement in this House today about these matters, which has now been adjourned for the debate. He has picked up the report about which he is supposed to have been making a statement and is making yet another statement on it. I would urge you, in the light of that, and given the fact that the question was not pointed to any particular uh, issue of the day, but it invited precisely the same sort of statement that he has already made, that you ask him not to renew it. There is some merit in the point of order, but I call on the Deputy Prime Minister to take note of that and to conclude his answer as quickly as possible. Speaker, happily, a little fact, bit of quiet, please, in the I, opposition. And I the wish government. to uh, add in uh, some additional information uh, uh, to uh, some aspects of the statement. In terms of that, I, I just remind the House, you may not like it, but we have put energy into the bilaterals. You neglected the bilaterals for years. And the words for that come from John Button, not from me. Uh, we put effort into uh, getting uh, increased market access. The coal, a canola, quiet, wool to Mexico, to give one example, but in the services area, Japan to open up the insurance market previously closed to Australia. And so I could uh, go on to detail other countries. I think what uh, we ought to realise, Mr Speaker, is very clearly, if we hadn't tackled your $10.5 billion deficit, our exporters would not have been and have a secure basis on which to operate. If we had not restored the economic fundamentals, our exporters could not have reached that $100 billion level. If we uh, had not have, uh, pursued the bilaterals, we would not have the improved market access we have today. And since the statement, since the period covered by the statement, to acknowledge the point taken by the Leader of the Opposition, I emphasise in the seven months since, we have in fact uh, put in an extraordinarily good export performance against the odds notwithstanding everything that is happening in Asia. And the reason we have done that is because we have been proactive on the bilaterals for our exporters, a balanced budget strategy, and providing real and direct and focused assistance to ensure that our exporters have a fair go. I call the Honourable Member for uh, uh, Jollybrand. It's my question to the Minister for Employment, Education, Training and Youth Affairs. And I refer the Minister to his recent announcement of the outcome of tenders for job network employment services and his claim that the new, new network is focused on results. I ask why is it that in the Melbourne Metro West region the top three private providers under current contracts 
have received no allocation at all for Flex 3 and very little for Flex 1, despite one provider being a finalist in the Quality Agency of the Year award last year and another notifying the second highest level of vacancies by private providers in the whole of Melbourne. Why is it that others with much less performance in Melbourne West have been substantially funded at both levels, and in what way do such outcomes represent focusing on results? I call the Honourable the Minister for Employment, Education, Training and Youth Affairs. Well, would you mind keeping quiet? Mr Speaker, I thank the member for Jellybrand for his question. The job network that the government is putting in place is going to provide greatly improved services and assistance to unemployed people in getting jobs. And it will do that for quite a number of reasons, but it will do it in particular because there will be many more job vacancies provided by the agencies in the job network. There will be many more sites available to unemployed people to get assistance. Some 1,404 sites will be available for basic job matching services and other services compared with less than 300 um, through the CES at order, the present the, time. I will leave the opposition. I ask the minister to resume his seat. And before I call him, can I ask all members to desist from the constant high level of uh, conversation that makes it extraordinarily hard for anybody to hear anything? The Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. I take a point on 145 relevance. The question specifically related to three providers in Metro West region. If the minister is unfamiliar with their performance, then perhaps what he ought to do is take the question on notice. But this is a statement. There's no that need he's to give him a lecture. It's not a point uh, of order, please. I call the honourable minister. He takes note. Oh, come Would on. you please keep quiet? I will give my ruling when it's appropriate. I can call the honourable. Are you going to persist? And, and the. Uh, All right. Thank you. I call the honourable the minister and ask. Would you please sit down? I am giving a ruling as I'm calling the minister. Thank you very much. And thank you for your impertinence. I call the honourable minister and ask him to take note of the matter of relevance to which the leader of the opposition referred. I'm quite capable of taking a ruling and giving a ruling without your assistance. Thank you very much. The, 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 question, the honourable minister. The question, Mr. Speaker, addressed the results well, you won't be here that would be coming it. from the job uh, network. And the most important result is that there will be a focus on getting unemployed people jobs. Now, within the, within the West and inner Melbourne area, there are over 25 contracted providers. They have been selected on the basis of quality and value for money. They, every, To well, of course, the member for Hotham, this loud the member for, the member for Hotham, of course, Thank you. value for money to the taxpayer was of no concern to him, because he spent $500 million on a program that cost $143,000 a job. Now, Mr. Speaker, in the context of the tender round for the establishment of the job network, there were over 1,000 organisations which tendered. Over 1,000. Every organisation went through, first of all, a very rigorous financial viability check. A very rigorous financial viability check. A little more quiet, please. And, and secondly, a very rigorous scrutiny of the quality of the, quality of the tender, quiet, the quality of the tender which was made. Now, the, the payment the system is a results-based system. Because for the first time, the successful tenderers will be paid according to their capacity not to place people in programs, not to turn them around to change the statistics on unemployment, but on the basis of their capacity to get people into jobs and take them off benefits. Within the, within the West Melbourne area, uh, one of the successful tenderers there, and it is somewhat invidious to name them, but I do just uh, identify one or two to give members of the House a sense of the quality of the successful tenderers in West Melbourne. Uh, Mission Australia has been contracted uh, to provide uh, uh, new uh, enterprise incentive scheme uh, payments, that is NICE services. Uh, there has been uh, a contract provided uh, with the Russian Ethnic Representative Council of Victoria 
uh, obviously to provide services to a particular section of the community. Uh, there has been uh, a contract uh, provided to the Salvation Army, uh, an organisation which has enormous respect to provide intensive assistance to the most disadvantaged job seekers. And one of the ways in which the job quiet, network please. is focusing on results, uh, and one can be you, quite confident will achieve results, is because by far the largest Honourable financial incentives because by far the largest financial incentives being paid to providers will be paid when the most disadvantaged job seekers are assisted. Uh, another tender, a successful tender uh, in the West Melbourne area was Job Futures Limited, who got many contracts uh, for sites around Australia and is a consortium of the Brotherhood of St Lawrence and uh, a number of other major uh, community providers. So there can be no question of the quality of the organisations, their links with community, their experience, who will be carrying through the government's commitment to unemployed people and particularly the most disadvantaged people. Every one of the organisations that the member for Jellybrand mentioned had a chance to tender. They may well believe, and maybe they will have, provided good services in the past. But in the end, they were not as competitive as the organisations which got contracts. A little more and quiet, please. They, they were subject to the most close scrutiny as to their, as to their outcomes. And members of the public can be very confident, very confident in the quality of the organisations which have received contracts under this tender process. Let me say finally, Mr Speaker, that the entire tender process was subject to the independent probity auditing of Blake Dawson Waldron, and Blake Dawson Waldron have signed off that they are entirely satisfied with the probity with which the tender has been conducted and with the fairness of the whole tender process to the every Minister single tenderer. Thank you. A, a point of order. Pursuant to um, Standing Order 321, I would ask the uh, Minister to table the document from which he was reading. Of course he was, you dope. Were you reading? I asked the Minister. The Honourable Member of Hotham could desist from his intervention across the table. If he persists in that, there is no need for him to behave in that way. Is the Honourable Member reading? The honourable minister is going to table the document. I call the honourable member for Hughes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the prime minister. Is the prime minister aware of spending and revenue proposals which would lower the income and living standards of Australian families? I call speaker, the honourable the prime minister. In answer to um, the honourable member for Hughes, um, uh, I have over the past few weeks. Uh, become aware of some uh, spending and revenue proposals emanating from the member for Dobell, uh, who is the shadow minister for health, that would directly attack uh, the living standards and the disposable incomes of ordinary Australian families. To start with, the member for Dobell, if he were to become a health minister in a Labor government, would immediately take away the $450 a year tax rebate for private health insurance. I mean, the, the member for Dobell for the, last, for the last six months has been running around Australia. Every time he opens his mouth, he tells us how unnecessary and what a failure the health rebate has been. And one can only conclude that the policy of the member for Dobell, if he were to become health minister in a Labor government, and presumably if a Labor Senator government Mr. were to be elected, he's the shadow minister for health, then his first act would be to increase the private health insurance premiums of average Australian families by taking away the $450 a year. But of course, Mr Speaker, it doesn't end there. On top of that, the, 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 very same, the very same shadow minister for health over the last six months has racked up spending commitments of between five and six billion dollars over a four-year period, and uh, you go through the list. He's uh, he's committed himself to completely reverse the savings that were made in relation to therapeutic premiums. He's committed himself to completely reverse. Uh, 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 rather, he's committed himself to support in full the additional demands made by the states in relation to the Medicare agreement. 
and those two commitments alone add up to about two billion dollars. Two billion dollars over a period of four years, and you can go through them item by item, list by list, and you get to a situation where the shadow minister for health has committed himself to spending proposals of a Labor government of between five and six billion dollars over a period of four years. Now, I mean, I mean, you can't. It's about time. And I put the members, I put the members of the opposition on notice. It's about time that they realise that this business Later. of being in opposition is not a sleigh ride. You can't run around the country slagging everything the government has done. You can't run around the country saying that, that, a, that a particular health subsidy is of no account. You can't run around the country promising to reverse spending cuts and then imagine that nobody on the other side is going to do their sum and ask the very fundamental question of where the money is coming from. So, on two count, he's going to take away the private health insurance premium, and that will increase by $450 a year the premiums of an average Australian family. So I say to all of those average families that have got health insurance, if you vote Labor, your premium will automatically go up by $450 a year. And not only not only will that happen, but if you vote Labor, if you vote a Labor, bit of quiet, you are going to you are going to lose that that interest rate cut equivalent to a pay of rise Canberra. of hundred dollars a week. And why is that going to happen? It's going to happen because if a Labor government were elected, they would put at risk the budget surplus that we have built up over the last few years. If you elect a Labor government, they will embark upon a spending spree, and you've got five or six billion dollars already from our little mate from Dobell. Our little mate from Dobell's already given us five to six billion dollars, and by the time the by the time we're to finished, the Prime to resume his seat. Uh, well, the member for Dobell. Um, no, no. When we're finished, the honourable Labor. member Watson on a point of order. The honourable member Watson. Thank you. A little bit of quiet, please, from both sides. The Honourable Member Watson, have you a point of order? Yes, Mr Speaker. Earlier you allowed the Leader of the House to reflect on a senator in contravention of Standing Order 75. You are now allowing the Prime Minister to reflect on a member in contravention of Standing Order 75. If you look it up or we'll get him to look it up, will you, will you make them comply with the Standing Orders? Thank you. I believe both of them are. I call on the Honourable Prime oh, Minister. Mr. Mr. Mr Speaker, can I say that I... I thought, in, I thought in the Australian lexicon, little mate was pretty endearing, actually. But, um, um, but if, if, the, if anybody on the other side is offended by it, well, I, I unqualified. I would have thought of the last 20 years. That's a pretty endearing expression. But Michael, I wouldn't get offended at that. People have called you much worse things than that. But if you are, if you are, far be it from me to give any offence to anybody on the front bench of the opposition. But can I just? Can I just say, Mr. Speaker, that this is not a cost game. Side. You can't have the luxury of being an opposition that nobody takes any notice of, and that you can run around the country saying, "Look, vote us in, and we'll, you know, we'll spend another three or four billion. Uh, vote us in, and we'll fix all this up." At the end of the day, what your political opponents do, and what the commentators do, is they start doing their sums, and they start saying, "Hey." If he's against the health insurance premium, that means he's going to take it away. And if he's going to if he's going to spend all of this money, then that's going to have a consequence. And you know what the consequence will be? It'll be higher interest rates. Because if you blow out government spending, you'll have a you'll have a large government deficit, and those interest rates will go up, and that one hundred dollars a week will disappear. Well, Mr. Speaker, can I say that this is instalment one? of getting back to reality and living in the real world and making the opposition understand that you can't go around the length and breadth of Australia making all sorts of reckless spending and all sorts of reckless taxation promises without being drawn to account. You are irresponsible when you're in government. You're being irresponsible in opposition. And I ought to give you notice that over the next few months the Australian people are going to find out just how irresponsible and how out of touch and how irrelevant you really are. And I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Can I suggest that there's no merit? 
As you, I'd also be interested in a few of you keeping quiet. I call on the Honourable Deputy Leader of the Opposition a question to vote. Yes, I have a question to you, Mr Speaker. Will you reconsider your decision announced at the outset of question time today that you won't accept any supplementary questions at all during your tenure in this chair? And if you won't reconsider and change that decision, will you please supply to the House a reasoned statement of how that decision is consistent with Standing Order 151? which reads, as you well know, and I quote, questions may be asked without notice. At the discretion of the Speaker, supplementary questions may be asked to elucidate an answer. I ask in particular, will you please explain how it can involve the exercise of a discretion when you've made it clear that your practice will be to invariably rule out supplementary questions in every case without listening to the terms of that question in any particular case or having regard to the particular context or particular circumstances. Is it not the case that to so rule and to so act would involve not the exercise of discretion, as you are obliged to uh, do under 151, but rather to involve the exercise of an absolute prohibition? A prohibition, and that that interpretation would apply in any court in the land if this were to be so tested. Is your decision? I further you are ask asking you. asking a question, not giving a lecture. I I'm asking. Now return your, well, if you're going your to sit seat. me down while I'm asking you questions, well, you've created an intolerable you situation. Draw your question to conclusion. You're not giving a lecture. I'm Will asking you, you to have regard question? to that particular question in giving your response. I'm also asking you to have regard with this how is, your decision is consistent. Your question is far too long. Please draw it to a conclusion. I'm asking you to please supply to the House a statement of your reasons You've for that decision. You have already asked that. I asked you to draw your seat. I am asking order, you to have you... regard to the specific language of 151, which refers to You've an answer. You have already asked that once. I haven't, no concluded. I haven't concluded by referring well, to 503 Will you please conclude your question? What other questions do you wish to ask? I am asking them, Mr Speaker, and if you listen, well, you will hear Well, at the moment you are arguing, you will ask him. I suggest I'm you ask and argue. I am asking you, will you please, in any statement that you make now, or hopefully in a more reasoned basis later on, indicate how— I take how that as a reflection on the chair. I will give a reasoned answer, as I wish not a more reasoned one. Thank you. Will you please have regard to the particular language of 151, which refers to an answer rather than answers generally in responding to my question? I would further ask you, if you are having regard to the traditional practice of this House, would you please make it clear how it is that that traditional practice can override as explicit a language as that which is contained in 151, and would I further ask you to have regard to the, the account of that practice as it's evolved on pages 503 and 4 of House of Reps practice, and in particular the conclusion that there that this is a practice undergoing further evolution, and would you I please explain you why it is that that decision that you made today is consistent with a further evolution when in fact it involves apparently a sharp U-turn on existing the practice? the Deputy Leader of the Opposition resume his seat. If you like to look at Standing Order 151, it says at the discretion of the Speaker, I'm exercising my discretion. Are there any further questions to the Speaker? The Honourable, you have a personal explanation, though, not a question.